in addition to like the the brinkmanship that the state is operating in, particularly with like, hey, this dev like made this thing we don't like, like let's throw him in jail. It's like, well, thanks guys. You've like made it very clear that like if you develop a tool that the state doesn't like, you can go to jail. Right. So what should you do? Oh, you should be an anonymous developer and you should launch your tools without any identity behind exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> and like this, is, and this will continue to happen. Same thing like, turns out I say like, you shouldn't get vaccinated on Twitter. I get totally censored. My, you know, I, it, it's very clear that I'm shadow banned. I have no interest in going back to Twitter. I post everything in the Noster now and I get great traction. People, you know, I have real interactions with people that are really great. Like it's fulfilling. And it best is, is that I can't be canceled. And to me, like, this is the constant brinkmanship that the state, but this is the constant brinkmanship the state is engaged in. That's, they're actually causing for the acceleration of all of this much quicker than anybody would have expected. Very much in line with the, the sovereign individual thesis of that, like, as states clamp down, people are pretty much going to be like, well, these people suck. Uh, the people over there are doing cool stuff. So I'm just going to move over there and hang out with them and keep building what I want to build. Eric Kaysen, welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show. We haven't been talking uh, to one another for for ages, I guess. How are you doing, man? Good to see you. I'm good. Yeah, I think it's been like, yeah, it's been like three or four years. So Jesus it's been Christ. a while. Time flies by. Oh, my God. I can't believe that. Well, I've been following you. I mean, definitely. I mean, uh, uh, not, not like every interview, but like uh, some major ones, some conferences you were on. Um, and... I think even on Peter McCormack's uh, one, some recent discussion. Listen, I mean, for for people who might not know you, maybe you just uh, you don't even have to you know introduce yourself. But you know, you're someone. It's an actual insult to say you're you love to talk about Bitcoin philosophy because you're one of the few ones or one of the handful ones, less than a handful ones, who really cut through the chase. You know, don't bullshit around. You have a holistic understanding, you know, what's the what's the root causes of all this shitty, you know, fucked up, satanic, whatever, criminal, uh, you know, beyond words, symptoms we have uh, in experiencing as a, as a species of human, humanity. And you just, you know, you're just so articulated. So um, I don't know. Do you want to add something about that? Like for people who might not know you? Uh, th thanks. I, I appreciate the accolades. Uh, I've been involved with Bitcoin for more than a decade. I was at Coin base early and then i helped build unchained and i'm i'm you know to me it was never about number go up it was that it was very clear to me that bitcoin offers uh you know really kind of the most important solution to the general suffering of our world today and for a long time i, I was uh in in my philosophical journey i felt like i was really struggling to understand like what my real question was and i, and I finally really come to the conclusion of that very similar to to most phenomenology and continental philosophy like to me i'm really concerned with the question of what does it mean to be human and specifically like what does it mean to be human in the 21st century where we have the internet we have the tools of cryptography and we also face this sort of global nihilistic cloud of darkness that seems to be consuming everything because well like a cabal of evil child eating satanic individuals seem to be running most of the global economy and the political system and like that's really dark to look at and for me personally like i would find no light at all within that and it would be only darkness nihilism and frankly death if we didn't have bitcoin because to me what bitcoin is it's the first real social contract that implements the law in a way that's novel because it's no longer involving uh, punishment and prohibition as functions for that law to operate. Like it just operates purely through cryptography and vis-a-vis -vis cryptography, like that allows for a totally new form of law that collectivizes us in a way that's never been seen in humanity before. Yeah. And before we start recording, I mean, we're just talking, let's just say in general, we're talking about like our, you know, private lives and our, our kids and, and homeschooling, you know, we talked about Daniel Prince, who is like totally, you know, the expert on homeschooling and, you know, he's got like a vast knowledge. And uh, the thought that I had before I even, you know, started um, uh, opening up this this Zoom call is uh, with you is that this, uh, this live chat is, I was like, gee, you know, when you have kids, 
everything fucking changes. I mean, you I mean, I mean, I mean, fuck low time preference. You, I mean, you start thinking like in decades, maybe in centuries ahead, you know, like how many, how many children, uh, you know, in, in our case, our, you know, three and a half year old daughter are going to grow up, you know, is she going to have a life? I mean, what about the magnetic field of the earth? Literally. I mean, uh, you know, most people are like so detached from reality, from facts, from evidence-based reality. That I talked to Daniel Prince, and he has got some some similar issues with, uh, you know, um, to be honest with you, with other Bitcoiners. Uh, uh, now he, he talked, uh, he talked. I was, uh, by the way, I was positive about you because you're so open and you're critical. You're you have a holistic understanding, comprehension of the reality of the reality, the truth that's going on. Because you start thinking into the future, not like days, months, years. You talk, you know, we're talking about like decades ahead. Like what's going to happen in the 2040s, 2050s? And we know by, I mean, I don't want to go too fast and too uh, like right now into the, you know, all kinds of rabbit holes. Um, but um, it is about, you know, like how is our existence, literally our human existence on this planet going to look like in the 2040s, 50s? Uh, knowing that the magnetic field of the Earth has been and is decreasing, weakening by orders of magnitude, at least, uh, you know, 5% per decade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we're talking about the last 150 years up to now. So let's, we can talk about this later, uh, but um, I just want to have like a sort of a more, yeah, just, uh, you know, look and feel and uh, for our audience, like where do you stand right now, you know, what about your children, uh, homeschooling, everything, you know, uh, always, of course, rooted and connected with Bitcoin? Yeah, I think, first of all, uh, you know, to, to me, children are really important in the process of having children, because now having another individual like on the planet that you share a true consanguinity with and that like they actually have real blood relations and you can see yourself in uh, to me, like that's a deeply transformative process that. I, I fundamentally believe people that don't have children cannot connect to that. And it's not for a lack of want or commitment or other things. Like it, it's really just about skin in the game in a, in a very real way. And so that being said, you know, uh, I noticed for myself that with uh, state-based education uh, and sadly, you know, like people in Germany don't have uh, the possibility of being able to actually homeschool their children. Uh, what I've found from that is that like there's very scary dialogues that get initiated that uh, create really damaging long term structures and not being able to address to your children like, yeah, like I understand the state does give us social services, which could be good. And they also like murder people openly, like outside of the judicial context. To me, that's really important. And you don't get educated about that really in in elementary middle high school and that's a really important factor because to me i want my children to understand that like the the state isn't here to help you even if they even if you do get guidance and sponsorship from them around things that ultimately is part of a much broader structure that's very alarming to me because uh to me part of the lies that we live within is that uh a lot of the dialogue that comes from general liberalism whether it's conservative liberalism or you know left-leaning liberalism is that it's extremely insincere uh, and it wants to talk about all of these great things the government does, but it doesn't want to acknowledge the systematic murdering of people. And one of the things that makes me really angry is like one of the things my my child came home with me and told me after, you know, after being in the third grade was they got lectured all day about how the environment's being destroyed and it's big, bad, evil corporations that are doing it. If we just elect the right people, we can stop them evil corporations. And I was like, well, well. Uh, I appreciate that because corporations do damage the environment frequently. But like, was there any talk about the U.S. military's environmental destruction? He was like, what? I was like, well, the United States military has caused for more environmental destruction than anywhere else in the world. For example, when we blew up the Bikini Islands, we took all that radioactive material, dug a hole on an island and dumped it in and covered it in concrete. Uh, and now it looks like that's probably going to flood and that's going to then get into the entire Pacific Ocean and probably kill most marine life. Was that covered by the how the evil corporations did that? Oh, because it wasn't. That was the United States military. Uh, is that so like, for me? That was sorry, regular public school or what kind of school is that? Like uh, this was actually a charter school, uh -huh. um, which in the United States, a charter school has more broad freedoms to be able to do what they want. But in the same way, because they do get a fair amount of state sponsorship, there's certain minimum standards they need to have. So the direction I went with tr choosing to homeschool my child was was that we're not doing any of the charter school, and we're also not 
there's a certain standards that you can meet for them and they'll give you like three thousand dollars in tax credits or something but to me like that's the that's part of their game so we rejected that and we're kind of building out a much more holistic program that involves lots of gardening woodworking other sort of skill sets that i believe will serve him better in the future um and to me like this is part of a, a much more broader responsibility is that Anytime that we allocate our responsibility to the state, they're going to manipulate us in particular methods and forms to make us more subservient to them. And for me personally, I'm not interested in that. And that's also connects much broader to like who and how do I want my children to be in the world? And so like I, I like I pay my children their allowance in Bitcoin. And when they ask for dollars, I say, yeah, you can get dollars, but like you need to pay me in Bitcoin first. And I've been. Uh, very pedantic with them about trying to educate them about that, like Bitcoin is real money. This is what we save in, you know, and it's funny to see them follow price action and they'll be like, oh, I want to buy this thing. But like, like the price has dropped. And I'm like, well, like, yeah, like maybe you should wait. And when, when you're not upside down anymore, the price will correct and, and like you'll actually have even more money than you thought. And it's just been really fun to see that education and kind of having them get it. Um, but on a bigger note, like, one of the things that alarms me the most is that there aren't serious conversations about the future and about the very deep and alarming systematic problems that don't seem to have any, not only really being addressed, but like they're not even acknowledged. And to me, like that's part of the gigantic global nihilism is that there's so much darkness going on that to really try to engage in it, uh, like means that you will go into existential anxiety. And if you don't have a real answer for it, like it's terrifying. And that's why, like, I can't have conversations with most normal people about this stuff because they will flip out when they start looking at all of it and they don't have a meaningful answer. And to me, that's really what Bitcoin is, is that when you look at all this darkness and you go, Jesus Christ, how do we address any of this in a meaningful exactly. way? Yeah, this is my if problem. you follow the right line of reasoning and questions, you eventually discover like, oh, Bitcoin actually is an answer to this. And a lot of times it's not actually Bitcoin. It's the cryptographic substrate that's making Bitcoin and that allows for proof of work and allows for us to use, you know, uh, to prove what's being said cryptographically as opposed to needing to trust somebody. And that solves a lot of endemic issues in our world today. And to me, like it's fundamentally about the systematic structure of law itself, which I, I am of, of the belief that like we lost the law a long time ago. And the finality of the closure of law was September 11th, 2001, when the United States state of emergency essentially said, hey, if we believe anybody on the planet is an enemy combatant, whether they're international citizens or Americans, we can capture them and deprive them of habeas corpus. And to me, like, that's the collapse of the law itself. And so how do we actually address that in a meaningful way if democracy has any meaning whatsoever? Do you have the feeling or impression that, um, uh, let's say, I don't know, a certain percentage of people have uh, suddenly, uh, like, woken up through whatever, would it be, you know, all this COVID uh, scam or, uh, you know, the whole bioweapon injection thing going on i mean at any top on any topic do you have the like do you have the the perception that that anything has changed or uh, people around you have woken up but not maybe maybe not you know admit it but somehow you you know you know they know but they won't admit it or you know maybe they they're afraid of losing face or you know what i'm saying yeah, and, and COVID really initiated that in a really powerful way, and it woke a lot of people up to being more curious. And I've actually found that that's widened quite a bit since COVID, particularly with the way that, like, it just sort of, it was like, oh, like, I guess the pandemic's done. And I was like, well, what, like, what happened? Is the virus gone? And they're like, well, no. It, meh. And they're like, huh, we just, like, screwed up the entirety of our lives for the last several years based on what seems to be a lie. And it's interesting because, like, uh, I still have some normie associates that like every once in a while the COVID thing comes up and it's pretty scary to me at how often you you get the alternative dialogue. They go, well, it was a dangerous virus and it like killed a lot of old people and like we, we really needed to protect them. And I'm like, oh, okay, like I, I appreciate that's what your belief, but like if we look at the statistics, like is that actually true? And like, again, like I really want to empathize that like, it's really scary to go into the belief that maybe our government actually did inject us with a bioweapon that they were intentionally doing gain of function research on through Chinese channels. And again, like I really want to emphasize, I get that scary. 
And what I've found really f- frequently is if people go that deep, they'll be like, well, why, like, why would anyone ever do that? Like, why that doesn't make any sense. Why would we want to release a bioweapon? That doesn't make any sense. And I go, and it's really scary because I go, well, if we look at the history of pharmaceutical companies in the United States, what seems to be their primary motive? Exactly. Look at the history. Yeah. And they go, well, I, I guess it's to make money. And I go, uh, yeah. And they go, well, they, they would never compromise the health of millions of people to make money. And I'm like, you know, you'd think that. But if we if we actually look at history and we look at what the largest criminal fines that were ever levied in human history, it was against pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. Yeah. Lying to people, yeah. and, and you lying know, to people in just ways that surface. killed thousands of people. Exactly, but that just isn't on the surface, Eric. Right? I mean, the thing is, you know, you just, you just, you were just uh, elaborating like it's so, it's so fucking evil out there, so much evil, so much satanic evil that uh, it's really hard. You need to put on really a lot of silk, like super soft silk gloves, because you don't know, you know, how you're gonna, you know. Uh, how are you going to maneuver the whole discussion? Because, you know, I mean, you're trying, you know, the, your best, you know, because you want to help, you want to educate, you want to inform, you want to empower the people around you. But like going into too much or too fast into the rabbit hole, it, it ain't working. I mean, maybe you can plant the seed and maybe in a few a few years, if it's not uh, too late by then, and usually it is, as we know, you know, um, most of our you know, friends, family got all injected. And now they're seeing the consequences, you know, or they're maybe they know people who know people at least, you know, who got, you know, sick or died or whatever. But I'm saying, you know, it's just so much. It's overwhelming. So uh, I guess do you start off like with the with the I don't know, maybe with the lowest hanging fruit of pain point, uh, would it be, you know, uh, monetary, in you know, uh, debasement, inflation, something like that, you know, because when I go to like an organic store, like nearby, there are people mostly, most of these people are actually critical, o- relatively open-minded. So you, you know where, you know, you can talk about, you know, a lot of stuff. And there was actually a lady in that store where we were, I was talking to the owner, you know, the lady of uh, the owner of the, of the store about allergies, and all kinds of stuff and then all of a sudden that lady who was a, just a, cl- uh, a customer of that shop you know started you know clinging clinging on to the discussion <laughs> it was amazing you know and 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 she started you know and we were talking like you know started about talking about like uh you know general vaccines up to you know and she was like i'm like totally like in awe shocked like she's totally informed about you know like uh, systemic pedophilia blackmailing adrenochrome harvesting i'm like what the fuck you know like who is this lady you know so it, there are some really really very few people whom you can start talking you just sense it you know so yeah just to go you know, close that loop to, like- to me a lot of that is, is just feeling it out and seeing where they are like there's certain people i start talking and it's very clear to me that they're unavailable at all and if i try to go past like hey like how's the weather today like it's probably going to be contentious and what I've found a lot of times is like if I get as deep in the example as I have, and they go, "Well, like, uh, like it doesn't make sense. That's evil." Like I always return to like, "Well, like what actually is evil?" And we start to talk about it. And I go, "Well, I look to Hannah Arendt a lot, and like what she talked about with Eichmann in Jerusalem, where she pointed out Eichmann, who like you know shipped people off for the actual Holocaust, when he was approached with the ethical question of what was going on, he was fundamentally incapable of thinking about it." Like, and, and that was like the same, like, look, like, whoa, this is too big. I can't, I can't talk about it. Like a lot of people do. And that really shows to me, like, that's what the nature of evil is. It's fundamentally unthinking. It can't self-reflect because if it could, it would understand what it was doing. So to me, the question when we approach and confront evil, it's not about understanding it or its reasoning because it doesn't have reasoning. Well, all we can do is in the face of that, choose how we're going to respond. And so for me with, You know, whether it's state mandated education, whether it's engaging in uh, the political climate or if we're talking about vaccines or anything like I I personally see the evil for what it is. I don't trust it. And furthermore, I I don't trust it because I can see the history of facts and evidence that go with it. So, So for me, I've made my decision over here about what feels comfortable and safe for me. Uh, And I hope other people will respect that. And I find it really interesting when people try to do like, well, you're not going to get your vaccine. So like, you're not going to love and protect everybody else around you. And I go, well, that feels very disingenuous to me because like my body, I can choose to do what I want with it. So like, let's say I have cancer and I don't want to get chemotherapy. 
should chemotherapy be forced on me because I don't want to do that to my body? And it's kind of interesting because a lot of times, like, I'm not interested in being right. Like, I'm I'm kind of interested in really digging into the questions and because, like, I'm curious if you're right. Like, I could be wrong and I'm open to being wrong. But, like, there are a whole series of things here that don't seem to add up. And one of them is, is that, you know, mitocarditis was like a relatively rare heart disease that people had before COVID. It's now much more common and seems to have increased about 20 fold. There seems to be a direct relationship there. And like, I'm open to it being something else, but that doesn't actually seem to line up. And again, that makes for some really dark shit. But just because it's dark, that doesn't give me a right to turn away from it and lie to myself. And more and more, like, I'm, I'm really realizing most people are intensely emotional cowards. And like, that's just how we've been raised. Like, we're not taught to do many things that are difficult or struggle or that feel uncomfortable. Um, and so like, I personally believe like if we're feeling a lot of discomfort around something, that's probably something to take a better look at. And so for me, like, I feel quite comfortable with my holistic worldview. And I feel like I actually have a real philosophical understanding of how I want to choose to live and interact with the world. Most people I feel like have never actually reflected deeply or thoughtfully on the questions of what does it mean to exist? Like, what does it mean that my government steals my money to murder other people? Like, what does it mean that we're all taught to repeat these lies to each other and believe them without really actually entering into critical thought. And to me, like that's kind of the big overarching thing that Bitcoin asks us is like, what does it mean to be in this world where we do have the internet, you and me can talk halfway around the globe to each other and we can use encrypted communication to keep our communication private secure and use that to actually support our wealth. To me, that seems to resolve some very, very profound questions about our world, but it also demands each of us to take individual responsibility for ourselves, our family, and our communities in the ways that we really want for ourselves outside of the purview of the state and governments. You know, um, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you and your wife or me and, my, you know, my wife, we are like super aligned, right? I mean, when it comes to the ESOS, to understanding, comprehension, knowledge, um, uh, you know, certain principles or, I don't know, or critical thinking, critical questioning <laughs> at all, right? So we're like super happy sometimes, you know, to meet people or to get to know people, you know, uh, would it be strangers or within our friends or communities or families, you know, who open up or maybe who, you know, might have been, you know, planted a seed and now they're starting thinking critically. But, you know, it's always great, you know, to get to know these people. So, um, uh, and especially if they have children, that's, that changes the whole, you know, uh, uh, dynamics, right? Because we invite them over, you know, for grilling, barbecue. It's it's great, you know, and you know, you know, you don't have to like think three times like, oh, should I talk about this? Should I not? I mean, it's like so frustrating, you know, and you don't, you don't even know where to pick them up, you know? I mean, uh, what, what kind of, I mean, it's so, it's so frustrating because, you know, uh, they have like a such a huge gap, such a huge lack of knowledge and comprehension and and thinking. It just I don't you don't know where to start, right? So uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's intimidating and difficult because like I only feel like I got the, to the conclusions I did from like a decade of, of very difficult work of diving into stuff that I didn't understand well or. or you know, just starting with Bitcoin, like my whole education was originally in modern monetary economics, you know, from fundamental fiat theory. And so going through that, very similar to what we were talking about, about state-based education, I found that after university, I had to go through all the Austrian economics and read a, about true economic theory and how the subjective theory of value actually like builds out the entire market-based economy. And I realized like, oh, like all this stuff that I learned from Keynes that I thought was really good it turns out that like that was actually like super evil and like when he talks about like oh like we're going to engage in modern monetary theory to stimulate the economy and you know the government can bias the economy to to growth and like that's all true but when you pull back the layer it's like that bias is to like make nuclear weapons and like build surveillance technology and and essentially it augmented the entire economy in such a way that it became subservient to the government and first and foremost developed technologies to empower them more and like, it's pretty terrifying to get that, but I also only understood that through reading through all the economic theory, understanding that real economic theory was destroyed with the gold standard, and that now we got this replacement that's biased towards the government that develops the entirety of the global world economy to be subservient to them. And that's like an abnormal, freakish development. 
you know, and then like that launched me into deeper philosophical inquiry about like, well, we're supposed to have law. We're supposed to be ruled by this way. Like, what does all this mean? And as I dug deeper and deeper, I got more and more answers. So now when I'm barbecuing and somebody's like, man, like the prices at the store are so high and go, yeah, like, do you, like, are you aware of why inflation is created? And they're like, yeah, them damn greedy corporations want more profits. And I'm like, huh, that's really weird. Do you think they didn't want profits in 2017? And they're like, N no. And I'm like, did we have as bad as inflation in 2017, even though the co corporations were just as greedy? And they're like, huh. And a lot of times, like, I, while it's annoying to me that we have to start at level one, I find a lot of times, like... If they're available, I can definitely throw out a lot of bait for them to be like, oh, you want to know more about economic theory? Like, you should read Anatomy of the State. Super good. Like, oh, you want to know more about laws? Like, you should read Batista. You know, like, oh, you want something about philosophy? Like, you, you should start with beginning with Heidegger, you know? Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. I but find they if they're open, interested. Right? Eric, they have, to be that? Open, right? they have to be open. That's a critical, I mean, issue or key. Uh, I mean, how do you open them, right? I mean, some people, you know, take psychedelics. Like, I mean, we are open to our psychedelics because it's one key of many. But, you know, sometimes it's just a conversation. Sometimes it's just a pain point. You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you open someone? Once they're open, then you can, you know, just feed them whatever, information, books, documentaries, films, interviews, podcasts, whatever that is, right? In all honesty, like I'm, I'm not interested in opening people anymore. Like I, I, I've been hurt too much from trying to do it, and I found that like if people are available for it, it's way easier and like a much, it, it's a much better experience for my soul. Uh, and so what I've actually found is, uh, like my wife is really into the idea of the free birthing movement, which is essentially like right. get pregnant, like don't go to the doctor, don't like don't have any of the reviews, and then like you birth your baby. And it's really interesting because, like, the entire idea is to, like, have your life at stake in giving birth because, like, that's what all women throughout all of human history had to do. And that's part of what made life sacred was that, like, you literally had to engage in a sacred process where, like, you could die. And she's super interested in that. That's super terrifying to me for a number of reasons. But, like, I fully support it because I do think transforming – because she's really big and we've been doing a lot of, of – pretty interesting philosophical work which has been really amazing together about what is the masculine feminine dynamic how did it get so fucking messed up and that like there seems to be a really interesting origin at the basis of like how birthing has been fully medicalized into like a systematic thing that is done to women and for her it's like as a woman going through this like you you feel you feel systematically raped you feel incredibly disempowered they try to pump you full of drugs they try to make the entire experiencing fucking terrifying as opposed to like a deep spiritual process of that like you are giving life to another being and you are transforming your own body to bring them into the world and so through those dialogues we've also connected that to like yeah like women being radically empowered in this way is extremely threatening to the state they will absolutely attack you top to bottom and that any woman involved in this work absolutely needs Bitcoin and it has nothing to do with number go up. It has to do with government not destroy your life. And that's where I've found more and more touch points for me. That's been really cool is whether I'm meeting psychedelic practitioners or uh, individuals that are like doing unlicensed rolfing therapy or it's a lot of people just into like weird esoteric stuff and they tend to be more spiritually inclined. And I've just found that that's an awesome point of, point of contact because a lot of times i go wow like you seem to be with it like what do you think we do about like global endemic wars that like we can't vote on to end and they go yeah it's fucked like i really wish i was empowered around it and i was like what if there was like a money that you could actually own that they couldn't steal from you that like if you want to get paid under the table you can like what would it really mean if you could connect up your community in a way that like governments couldn't actually get in to exploit and destroy what you've built and like now they're like you, what, like does that exist I go, yeah, like you probably have your opinions about it, but they're probably wrong. And let me tell you why. And they go, okay. And I'm like, Bitcoin. They like scoff. And then they go like, no, like I, somebody already told me about Ripple and like, I know crypto. And I go, well, if you think Ripple is crypto, you're like absolutely wrong. And let me tell you why. And then we usually have a really awesome two and a half hour conversation where at the end they're kind of confused and I kind of shove the fire hose in their mouth. But at the end they're like, I'm going to look into this. Like, let me, l l let me come back to you with more questions later. And yeah, it's been pretty cool. I've probably got, you know, maybe six different threads with different people going where they reach back out to me every few months. And they go, hey, like, I just want an hour conversation to talk about it. And for me personally, because it's like so fulfilling for me, like I'm like, this isn't 
consulting or anything. It's just having a conversation with a friend, trying to lead them where they need to go. And for me, that's been really rewarding. And frankly, like this is my life's purpose. I don't know why or how, but to me, really trying to get people to think harder and really connect with how are we going to change our world in a meaningful way for everybody is really important. And most people aren't available for that. And that's okay. And I'll be open to if they come back around at another time. Yeah. You know, people like you and me, I mean, we're, um, so many others, you know, within the, let's just say in the broader you know, Bitcoin space community, I mean, we've somehow found our, you know, not only your ethos, our sense of, you know, a purpose of life and now the essence of, you know, having a child, you know, raising child, it's, it's just, uh, all, it's just overwhelming sometimes even for me, you know, it's because it's so, it's, uh, because you, you, I mean, to be honest with myself, I mean, I, you become uh, sort of uh, vulnerable, right? When you have children, it's like, right? You open up yourself, you know, to this whole everything, right? But because it's this is the essence, right? It's the seed of the essence of of, of love, of 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 nurturing, of of you know, of deepest, deepest, unimaginable empathy. But anyway, I was gonna say, I was gonna say something else, and it's like, um, uh, you know. Um, when when I talk to people, it's like I mean I I, I sense that in the last let's say few years or especially in the last couple of years, I think the environmental conditions or the psychological conditions. Now it will always persist, always been persisted, right? The fear, deep deep layers, different layers, all kinds of shades of fears, cognitive dissonance, ra rationalization, you know, right? But uh, the environmental conditions have somehow the psychology have some a little bit change and i think we have a lot of people and um you know we have cooperation partners you know who we, we want to start off with you know with this website bitcoin 21 uh in austria you know like doing uh, for free like presentations and going you know to to all kinds of communities you know uh, little towns and doing all these presentations like what is bitcoin what is money what's inflation right just just pick them up like on a general level but i nice. but, even if you go like to a like to certain stores or uh, there's a like a like a shop like a what do you call it like a tire you know tire who who changed tires right and we yeah, found, we found out like a couple of years ago that he he had already been like accepting Bitcoin for many many years right but only on chain you know nothing nothing fancy and I, I and then I persuaded him you know to get a Lightning wallet so it's great it's like right around the our corner so you see the world so small right so. Uh, do, do you have the impression, the perception that things have changed around you? Like and it's more easily like besides the whole, you know, oh, you know, so so called you know, conspiracy theories and woo woo and 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 evil stuff. But do you have the feeling you can like you know initiate a discussion with with people easy more easily? Uh, I think so. I usually kind of throw out a couple couple of pieces of bait to kind of see how they take it and what their opinions are. Uh, I think more interesting for me is like I've. I've had a number of people kind of in my little community reach out that are Bitcoiners that, who they're like, oh, like I heard you on podcasts. I was surprised to see you're in the area. And yeah, and we've just met up and had really great conversations. Uh, and for me, like the entire ecosystem so far advanced now where it's really interesting of that. Like, it's very clear to me that there's an actual zeitgeist going on. Like for, you know, really for like my first five years in Bitcoin, it was a lot of existential, like, I don't know if any of this is going to work. Like, I'm totally 100% in. Like, I don't know if other people will get it either. Because like, maybe I'm seeing something that's just a figment of my imagination. But really, after the block size wars, I found a lot of people because because like, for me, what the block size wars represented was it wasn't clear if Bitcoin was going to become this corporate tool. And it's still not clear if that's going to happen, particularly with some of the other capturings going on. But at least what happened in the block size wars to me was a, a, a very meaningful amount of resistance came up where people were like, no, like we're not corporate Bitcoiners. We're cypherpunks. This is peer to peer money. It's not designed for the state or corporations. And we're going to fight for that in a meaningful way. And so at that point, like this whole plethora of actors sort of popped up where I was like, oh, like the, these are my people. And as we connected more, I realized like. Bitcoin's just the tool we're all using. Like the 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 greatest truth is like we're all truth seekers and we're all individuals that have that as a hierarchical thing in our lives that's really important to us. And that's why when we ask these questions, we find when other people are with us, like they want to pursue that truth as well. Whereas what I would say is like a lot of normies, they reject that and want to run away from it. And for me, like those normies will always reject and run away from that until they have their own existential event where they go through their dark night of the soul and really come to terms with what's going on, which may not happen. 
Whereas people that seem to be available have already gone through that nihilism and blackness and they're, they're, they're available to actually go, is there a way out of this? Like, is there an actual thing we could do? Is there a way to find light? And I go, yeah, well, like it, it turns out like we're actually in a cave and like all the shadows you see on the walls, like that's, that's not from natural light. That's from shadows that have been created. But if you want to climb with me outside of, to the entrance of the cave through all of that darkness, which I get is super scary, we will find light, but like you, you need to follow me if you'd like to, and here's how we'll get through this. Um, so yeah, I feel like it has transformed quite a bit. Uh, I feel like we're actually just at the beginning of all of this because um, the thing that strikes me the most is that like over really over the last two and a half years or so, like I've traveled probably about 200,000 miles, just like traveling around the world, going to events, talking to really? people. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I've been all over Asia, all over, you know, went to the middle East, was all over Europe, spent a bunch of time, you know, went to Australia, New Zealand. Well, all of this was to meet Bitcoin. Was well. that, alone or, or partially by loan or what or this was mostly alone usually it was to like go to different conferences that were going on whether they were big or small and then usually there was like tertiary events that were private that i got invited to and what struck me more than anything is like i've now met hundreds of people who like very personally confessed to me though like i've like had transformative spiritual experiences through bitcoin it's kind wow. of fucked me up this seems really weird and i always kind of laugh and i'm quite jovial and i go look like I'm sorry, like, I don't mean to make light of it. I'm like, but I've, I've had dozens, if not hundreds of people come to me and say these things. And so for me, like, this is actually kind of normal. And I want to let you know, like, lots of people see this, lots of people feel it. And so when you go into an environment like that, there's such a high frequency of people that are like kicking ass, doing creative things, really building really intelligent, dynamic people. So like, anytime I go into that environment, I'm like, oh, shit, like, we're winning so fucking hard. The development here is so much more beyond anything else. And then more interesting too is like I've gone to a number of shitcoin conferences too, and most of that's to kind of observe what their conversations are. And they're, you know, not to be pejorative, but like they're they're very superfluous, shallow conversations. That's usually like, oh, we're gonna like get really rich. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so and then like then what? And they're like, huh, what do you mean? I'm like, okay, so like you're rich. Like now, now what happens? I'm like, uh, I like buy a bunch of stuff. And I'm like, cool. And then, uh, and like I, and it's really interesting because like I actually find that so many, because like the naked truth to me is what it is, is that so many people are engaged in this uh, existential terror that's involved with saving in fiat money where like you can never actually do it because it's always evaporating. So it's just like pure schizophrenia of like get as much money as possible. And so like they're never able to actually connect to like, what if you had all the money you ever needed? What if it maybe even it's deflationary? And like, what if money wasn't your primary mode of person? Like what, what would you actually do with your life if you just had to create things as opposed to try to make money? And they're almost like, what? Like I, why would you want to do that? I'm like, well, maybe we have different values here. Yeah. And so for me, it's been really powerful to understand that like Bitcoiners are really interested in first and foremost producing and creating and like solving problems in the world in a really, really meaningful way. Whereas my experience with shitcoiners are like, they're really interested in making money and like they, they really believe what they're building is great. But like, this is always the fundamental flaw that I find kind of at the bottom of what they're talking about is that they're like, well, yeah, it's like really decentralized and like it's peer to peer. And I'm like, but you're the founder, right? And they're like, well, yeah. And I'm like, and like you own like 20% of the total tokens. And they're like, uh, well, yeah, but like I built it, so I deserve that. And I'm like, okay. So like, can't I just like, up, like, couldn't I just tell you that like guys showed up at your family's house with like firearms and were threatening them and like wouldn't you just give me all the money or like the keys that control that wallet and like is it actually decentralized or cryptographically secure if like i can attack all the different founding members and they're like huh that's weird and so to me like this is what connects bitcoin back to actual economic war theory is that like satoshi nakamoto satoshi nakamoto chose to be an anonymous individual and use perfect perfect forward secrecy in order to protect himself because like if he was a real human being today, there is no conceivable way that like he would actually not be a captured individual, which goes to prove why cryptography and the actual war theory that goes with it is so important.
Um, okay, now that's interesting. Okay, so um, let me let me uh, make a, a quick jump to um, the, the connect the topic. But um, you see all these, you know, people like you know Michael Saylor and and then you know all this ETF garbage. <laughs> I mean, you know, this whole co-opting and and there's you know discussions with. Uh, Whitney Webb and um, Mark Woodwin, I think, is this is, is her corporation yeah, partner. Me, me and Mark are yeah we're close, and we've had a really? number. Are of, you, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like last year in Amsterdam, me and him hung okay. out for because there's been some criticism about you know uh, lately in the I think one of the last recent discussions or articles that they co-wrote or something like that. That like, you know uh, might be that you know it could be you know that 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 uh, Whitney Webb. Is not real, you know, Bitcoin. And so, you know, so be it, you know. But uh, it's like um, I think the criticism is like it's like too much doomsday scenarios, but no constructive like solutions. But it's like, uh, and some people say, you know, like hardcore, you know, Bitcoins, and say, you know, she hasn't really understood the the essence or the ethos or the principles behind Bitcoin. And, and, I mean, I don't know. Do you want to share your thoughts or is there any? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think she does. I think Mark also gets it, like mm -hmm. Mark more so than a lot of other people. Um, I think that they bring up very strong criticisms and worries that, that are very real. Like we, to me, like right now in Bitcoin, we are going through uh, like a second uh, civil war. And yeah. but the difference is that this is a cold war, and part of that cold war is figuring out who and how mining is going to be controlled, who and how on and off ramps are going to be controlled, how CBDCs are going to get integrated into this, the relationship that Tether has to Bitcoin, and like all these are very strong and important criticisms. To me, it doesn't actually collapse Bitcoin at its base for a number of reasons. Uh, and me and Mark had a lot of dialogues about this, is like. This is one of the reasons that I won't shit on inscriptions is because to me, inscriptions has very powerful techniques that haven't been applied or utilized thoughtfully yet. Uh, there's been some cases like uh, I really liked what Project Spartacus did with inscribing the WikiLeaks war logs that Julian Assange was in prison for on Bitcoin as a proof of concept for like future genocides. In addition to like, I love the fact that an individual reached out to me and they're like, yo, like I, I just like put plans for a 3D printed gun like on the blockchain. I was just like, fuck yeah like that's the stuff i'm really interested in and that's the stuff that even if the paypal mafia and all these people control 90 percent of mining they still can't get around it and to me a lot of the core cryptographic techniques that bitcoin offers and the ability to have a public chain to that you can exchange not only wealth but data on is really important and so like i think a lot of their criticisms are very strong and important and, and like the only other critique that i would have about their methodology of journalism is like they really connect the dots a lot and they do really good at being like, these guys are all on the same board. These guys hang out. These guys are friends, you know, and like, this is the entire concept of what unlimited hang, like what a, a limited hangout is. And I think that in that observation, it's really important. And also it fails to neglect that a lot of people aren't uh, like involved deeply in these conspiracies. Like they're, they're much more of uh, adequate puppets that happen to find themselves at the right place at the right time. And they're dumb enough to be manipulated. I think that's most of the individuals that are involved. And then I actually think the very top echelon of individuals are like part of like the child eating satanic cabal that's like sacrificing people and like really trying to pull all the strings. But I think 90% of the people are, are relatively innocuous. In addition to the fact of that, um, while all of these connections are made, uh, to me, it's really important to understand that like at the basis of it, like these people are all criminals and liars. And so like trying to actually get them to orchestrate amongst themselves in a meaningful way where like there can be mutual positivism uh, is like a really difficult thing, I think, for that class of people. And to me, like that's one of the keys that really makes Bitcoin work at its fundamental basis is that like even if we have the PayPal mafia and all of these people in Western governments working together, there's nothing that they can do about individuals that are in China working together and individuals that are in Russia working together. And like, this is what comes back to war theory is that like Bitcoin has been deployed wide enough and is important enough now that we have entered into the prisoner's dilemma of game theory between nation states. And the problem is, is that like even these super wealthy individuals are always beneath those nation states and how they work together. So a great example is like, trying to get somebody like Jeff Bezos and uh, the king of Saudi Arabia to work together will never happen. Like they are clearly have strong amenity between each other and they will war with each other. 
that's to Bitcoin's benefit. Like that's really important. Same thing, like you're not going to get the CCCP working with the American government for Bitcoin censorship. Like they're going to actively work against each other to do that. And like that's the field that Bitcoiners are going to be very successful in. I also want to say that like uh, while being a big fan of both Mark and Whitney's work, like I haven't read the through, through the full chain of custody article. Uh, you know, it's like an hour long read. Um, but I think like what I have read of it, they bring up many important points that I think a lot of Bitcoiners aren't being very thoughtful about their criticisms, that they're trying to kind of push them away and be like, well, that's not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so like, for example, like I, I think Bitcoin ETFs are just dangerous across the board. I think they're stupid. I think it fundamentally violates the idea of what Bitcoin is. And I think that this is a path that they want to capture Bitcoin through. Uh, and they probably will. And furthermore, most Bitcoin is deployed to private wallets that are held by individuals. If Bitcoin goes to the moon, that will be advantageous to them. I have found that as the price goes up, there tends to be a uh, a lot of Bitcoiners kind of chill out. And they're just like, yeah, you know, like the world's still shit, but I'm rich, so it's okay. I think that's part of their strategy to implement it. Uh, but like the problem is, is that like they always fail to deal with this radical 10%. And so like... There's a radical 10% of Bitcoiners that are just like, yeah, now I'm rich and fuck the state. And like, I'm going to use my power to destroy the state. And it's really interesting because to me, like, that's the that's the most sincere economic development that's going on is a bunch of Bitcoiners understand that like, OK, we're going to go to a Bitcoin standard. Having companies that have BitFlow is unequivocally the most important. And furthermore, like the entire Internet is up for grabs on the redevelopment on a Bitcoin standard. So like I can get really, really rich. I can develop something that's ethical and moral and a company that will last for hundreds of years. So like there's like a very strong incentive to build against these people and furthermore to like trick them as well to like go to the VCs and be like, yeah, yeah, you should like give me a bunch of fiat because like I'm going to help you out. And they'll be like, yeah, yeah, like here's all your fiat. And then it turns out that like you can actually use their money and power yourself and not necessarily need to be on their side. And so to me, like, Bitcoin's really interesting right now because, and I always saw this development of that, like you essentially, you got anarchists and they went to the capitalists and they were like, yo, like, what if I made you fighting the state the most profitable thing you could do? And they're like, yeah, like, tell me more. And as they're developing these things, they don't really understand that, like, that's them bringing the Trojan horse into Troy. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there anything else besides, I mean, what's uh, been, uh, we've been thinking about, like uh, that we should, we should think about or be careful about, like uh, besides the ETF, you know, garbage and, and everything else and the co-opting threat in this, in this stable coin, which I, by the way, I respect totally the work of Mark Goodwin and, and you know, with the web, especially about stable coins. I think they're totally on, you know, on, on, on spot on this, but is there anything else like it's concerning? Uh, I mean, and I think everybody's presence to this is just censorship and, and the manipulation that's going on in social media on a whole. And uh, I mean, to me, that's one of the reasons my book, Crypto Sovereignty, why I feel so strongly about having given it that title as opposed to like Bitcoin sovereignty is that like cryptography is fundamentally what gives us the praxis of being able to build all these tools. And Noster is an amazing and excellent example of that. And I think that's this is just the first of a suite of tools that we'll get to where we will get peer-to-peer -peer decentralized encrypted file sharing. We will get, you know, VoIP telecoms. We will get, you know, all of these things that eventually become tools and practices that we use. Uh, but with that being said, like, I feel very strongly it's always going to be a minority of people that lead it. And that's yeah. really what my interest is in. And that's one of my strongest criticisms of democracy is, is like, I'm not interested in voting in a collective where 51% can choose to ask the other 50% to kill themselves. You know, like I, right. I'm really interested in a small ma radical minority that is, is the intransigent minority that maintains the standard. Always, you always know? like that. Like, so like one of the things a lot of people, right. They talk about like, you know, like uh, uh, pushing for, for new op codes, like op cat or something like could mm -hmm. be very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that. It could be very dangerous. And I think that like, there's always the option of, of uh, ossification and not like we can just sit back and just run Bitcoin as it is today and we'll be in a decent position. Um, but with that being said, like I, I do think there's lots of dangerous things going on. I do think the general status number go up like I'm just a conservative American. That I believe in the political climate, but we really need to limit it. To me, like those guys aren't my allies. Like they're just soft status that just want, they want the state to operate for them. And, and like, 
I understand the appeal of that perspective and I'm not interested in it. Like I'm interested in destroying the state and making it non-functional so that like we can discover what the organizational process for humanity will be after this. Cause I'm convinced that like the internet unequivocally is the most powerful piece of technology that's ever been created. It's global. It's available for everybody. We can encrypt it. I don't see why this shouldn't be the basis of a totally new form of political system. And when I say a new form of political system, I mean like the same transition that happened in 1776 with the declaration of the American Republic. Like at that point in time, every nation on earth was fundamentally a monarchic one. And the idea of representative democracy was pretty ludicrous. And within 100 years, every country on the planet was now a representative republic with some kind of parliamentary form. And that was like very, very novel and unexpected. And so, like, I don't see why we can't create a new global political collective based on the Internet, based on these technologies and based on our ability to use them and collectivize ourselves in a meaningful way. Uh, with that being said, I think a hell of a lot more suffering and difficulty has to happen before that thing produces itself. Mm -hmm. Huh, that's pretty interesting. You take care. Um, let me see um, before. Uh, let me just uh, post this. Um, uh, our live chat on uh eric uh so do you see i mean you, you just mentioned nostr um now uh, when we come to bitcoin of course you know of course the usability user friendliness user interface i mean has has enormously i mean improved right in the within the last years right i mean exponentially i mean it's become so easy so much uh, you know so smoother so uh, do you see that same process i mean or do you are you satisfied with the speed that it was going with Nostr, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer decentralized censorship resistant, you know, a sort of social network? Or um, do you think it should it should actually go even faster than that? I mean, uh, I mean, whether I want it to accelerate or not, I don't think I'm going to make a hell of a lot of a difference about it. Uh, what I'm what I'm most excited about is that like it just exists and like this can't go backwards. Like we can't right. we can't just suddenly destroy the Nostr protocol. Um, in addition to the fact of that, to me, like, this is the most interesting part is where there's now this whole form of thought where people go, oh, like we have these like cryptographic tools. Uh, we like have a way for people to have social media peer to peer being anonymous. Like, what can we build that? And we're like seeing people are like, oh, like here's this new market. Like here's a new kind of GitHub. Like here, there's all of this cross pollination on experimentation that I think is going to keep getting more and more robust and more and more powerful. And to me, like, this is what the fundamental bloom that the cypherpunk movement seems to be offering is that, like, people get that, that encryption technologies are the most powerful thing they can use to fight state surveillance and empower themselves. And there's, like, a whole litany of really interesting, creative, and powerful ways to do that that we're just starting to scratch the surface of. And so, like, one excellent thing that was really amazing to see was, like, you know, the state was coming after mixing services. It was very clear that Wasabi had a gigantic target on itself. And because Nostra had been developed, it was just in time for them to go, oh, like we can actually just like essentially marry Wasabi and Nostra together. So like you can find other people to mix with who are anonymous and like very novel way that the coordinating problem was now solved that kind of like just in the nick of time made it so that like Wasabi had actually made itself obsolete. And it was really amazing and interesting to see that. And I think we're going to see a lot more stuff like that. In addition to like the, the brinkmanship that the state is operating in, particularly with like, hey, this dev like made this thing we don't like, like let's throw him in jail. It's like, well, thanks guys. You've like made it very clear that like, if you develop a tool that the state doesn't like, you can go to jail. Right. So what should you do? Oh, you should be an anonymous developer and you should launch your tools without any identity behind it. Exactly. <laughs> And like this, is, and this will continue to happen. Same thing. Like, turns out, I say like you shouldn't get vaccinated on Twitter. I get totally censored. My, you know, I. It, it's very clear that I'm shadow banned. I have no interest in going back to Twitter. I post everything in the Noster now, and I get great traction. People, you know, I have real interactions with people that are really great. Like, it's fulfilling. And it best is is that I can't be canceled. And to me, like this is the constant brinkmanship that the state. Oh, you're muted, so I can't hear you. But this is the constant brinkmanship the state is engaged in that's they're actually causing for the acceleration of all of this much quicker than anybody would have expected very much in line with the the sovereign individual thesis of that like as states clamp down people are pretty much going to be like well these people suck uh the people over there are doing cool stuff so i'm just going to move over there and hang out with them and keep building what i want to build 
Yeah, and especially in Nostra, you know, you don't have the, all this crappy, you know, fucked up algorithm and, <laughs> you know, all kinds of, you know, sp- selective, uh, I don't know. It's, 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 well, don't... like, yeah. So, so like, I was feeling, I, I, I just noticed how much I was feeling angry from going on Twitter and mm-hmm. how much I was really, I just wasn't feeling good about it. So in August, I was like, you know what, I'm going to take a total break from social media, except Noster. I'll keep posting on Noster and interacting there. I found from coming away from that, I was like, I really like Noster because like it, it feels like a small house party. Everybody's pretty sociable and nice. There's a couple of assholes, but they're easy enough to mute. Uh, and then I went back to Twitter and I was like, God damn, I was like, stu- like stuff is just fucked up and hateful here. And and in coming back, I was like, oh, like, like this is the algorithm doing what the algorithm does. Like it, it wants me to watch a gore video and then it wants me to see a, a contentious debate on Twitter. And like it, it wants these extreme emotions that it can take advantage of. So then it can try to sell me shit. And I just realized I was like, oh, like. This is so removed from what social media was. Like, this isn't what MySpace was in 2004. This wasn't what Facebook was in 2006. Like, we used to want to just connect and yeah. share and interact. And now with how uh, essentially the brain cycles and the algorithms have made themselves more extreme, it's this weird ego thing that's going on that I don't think most people are aware of how much the algorithm plays on that and manipulates you through it. And I think really getting a chance to detox and step away and then come back into it and seeing what it's giving you and how those emotions affect you. For me, it was pretty extreme of that. I was like, oh, like, turns out that like all of the violent videos that Twitter wants to show me actually like makes me feel pretty angry inside. And even when I set my phone down and spend time alone, I still feel angry about that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, is this really something worthwhile in my life? For me, the answer is no. And Furthermore, like, I really like social media and getting to connect in that way. But, like, this was so detrimental, I can't do it. And that's why Noster is really great is that, like, I'm now empowered to, like, have my own feed to be able to use whatever client's giving me the data that I like the most. In addition to the fact that, like, I can say whatever crazy shit that I want and I know that nobody's going to cancel me for it. So, for me, it's been really wonderful in getting that, like, this is here. Other people want that and they want to participate in it. And, like, the most exciting thing to me is, like, they they can't kill Noster. Like, the the more people that get on it, the more dangerous it becomes, the harder it becomes to start muting people. And, yes, there's a plethora of issues that come with that. But very similar to Bitcoin, you can't kill it. And, like, those technologies are so important because, like, like that that's their superpower. You cannot kill them. So it means that you can just keep building forever on top of that. Exactly. And more and more people get more invested in that. And so for me, like, I'm really interested in, in building, because I've been thinking more about doing a podcast and doing my audio book and, and really trying to do like a deeper philosophical presentation of crypto sovereignty. And I'd really stepped, like, I, I'd been preventing myself from doing that because I didn't want to engage in all the social media and trying to promote, and I'll, like, all this bullshit. I was like, I'm so uninterested. And Noster has just given me this really novel thing of like, well, shit, I can just live stream on Noster, post all my stuff there and people can zap me as much as they want or don't want to. And it'll just be a fun thing. That's really about my engagement there. And I also know that, uh, I get to build all this content and it's not in danger. You know, like I recently saw, saw that Nico is simply Bitcoin. He was canceled on YouTube Mm -hmm. after years of hard work and building. Just so fucked up. But what we, you just get killed. What was the reason? I mean, oh, so you violated our terms of services, which is like a 50 page document. So who knows? Yeah. I mean, Candace Uh, Owens got, you know, censored. I mean, to a lot of people, I mean, recently, you know, because of whatever, if you just say one word, like one, uh, you know, (laughs) critical word, it's anyway. To me, like, this is really dangerous because, like, if I say some of those uncritical words, like, one is that, like, Let's say I'm advocating for really nasty political theory. Well, I want other people to be able to come to me and go, well, like, are these true? Like, is that like we should be able to have a real debate and you should be able to use your own knowledge and truth to go, oh, that's bullshit. And I don't believe in that. I find it way more dangerous to be like, let's censor these people because like now that thing's powerful. And it's Mm -hmm. like, huh, well, like they won't let me read it. So like maybe I should find it. And then they get to read it and there aren't strong critiques of it because it's not done openly. And so like. I, I don't know. Like I, I find it really surprising when I actually meet people that advocate for censorship 
and when they use words like uh, misinformation. And the and the it's funny because I always go misinformation. That's interesting. Like, how long's that word been around? Like, when do you when did you start using that word? Like, like, conspiracy like, theory. I've used it. like conspiracy. I'm like really because I was like I, I remember in 2020 that being like a really strong word that came up and people didn't use that word before. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, do you think it's possible that that word was actually like put in your head in a way that you don't fully understand? Because like, what is mis- misinformation? Like, well, it's just it's lies. And I'm like, well, again, is that true? Because like, if it was just lies, like, shouldn't you be able to like meet it with the truth and factual evidence that then like critiques me? And like, isn't your position all the more powerful now too? And they're like, well, no, like that's not fair because like you presenting that knowledge really obscures and 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 challenges it in a way that's very difficult to work with. And I'm like, well, if that's if that's also true, like doesn't that actually really detract from what you're saying? Because like if you need to stop me from saying what I need to say because it disempowers what you're saying, it seems like you're actually probably not on the side of truth, and mm-hmm. that's kind of alarming. Right. <laughs> and like usually by that point, it's pretty the debate's not going to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. But I find it really interesting presenting these things to to people because a lot of times I think they actually know what's true, but it's really hard for them to look at it. And it's really frustrating because they want to. And this is the thing I find the most interesting about modernity is that people people have a very strong belief that if something feels true or if it feels good, then it must be true. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things I've tried to point out is like, look, like I really like the idea that the government loves all of us and wants to give us the best possible health that we have. That's like a really nice feeling. <laughs> I have to look at the fact that, like, the United States government sponsors sugar companies to put that sugar in our cereal, which now seems to have led to having the fattest and the most diabetically enhanced population that has ever existed. That doesn't seem to be a very loving thing to me. And again, I get that it's really dark, but it turns out that these sugar companies give lots of money to the politicians that pass the laws. Again, it sucks. It's unfortunate. But that really seems to indicate to me that the government doesn't have our health at the best interest, and it seems like they have their own pocketbooks at the best interest. And again, a lot of people don't want to hear this because it's very difficult. Um, And it's funny because I feel like here in America, it's it's like a lot easier to see than it is in Europe necessarily. And I feel like because of the way the European parliamentary system works, like I think there's still a fair number of... uh, they, they have good intentions, but they're so disempowered and they're so confused about how the state operates that they continually want to allocate power to the state as a methodology. Mm. And again, like, I don't think that they're uh, nefarious, but I think a lot of times they're they're very self-invested. Whereas in America, I feel like it's easier to just be like, they want money. It's very clear they want money. We can see how they get their money. Like, it's a very clear pathway. Whereas mm. I at least my perspective of Europeans, it seems like that pathway isn't necessarily as clear. Yeah, it depends on well, what do we talk about. Yeah, but but you know when you talk about it in general, like but the European Union and <laughs> the whole this whole communist takeover. <laughs> I mean, this is a communist takeover. I mean, what do you mean, you know, it's so fucking centralized. It's so dictatorial and 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 tyrannical. It's pretty funny. It's pretty funny that you guys fell for that scam. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, listen, uh, I want to zoom back a little bit, like, um, when you look at, you know, this whole, uh, provocation of World War Three. I mean, this, uh, psychopathic, satanic, Lucifer, worshipping, I don't know what the word would call it, military industrial complex, uh, whatever complex, I mean, they're, they're pushing for, I mean, I don't know what, what, what is this? I mean, a part of the, you know, besides the whole political clown show, like, how do you, how do you, how do you see this whole thing evolving? Like, like pushing for World War Three or what is this? And Israel, the systemic genocide and, and, you know, we don't need to go into specific, but like, you know, just zoom out and give me your perspective, like on this whole evolution. Or <laughs> I mean, like my, my deepest, craziest thoughts or, or like, yeah, yeah, people? yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. <laughs> Uh, my deepest, craziest thoughts are that, like, I I actually think to look like we're in the event that leads up to the actual, uh, like, apocalypse itself. And, like, I, like, I think this is all, like, a very deep and insane religious thing that's going on. And, like, I, I don't think that's because, like, it, it's all, like, magical and religious. Like, I actually think that this is just the concourse of development of, like, what happens when evil takes over in the world. Because, like... Evil is a fundamentally totalitarian thing that, like, wants to know everything and wants to profit. And, like, it it operates from this place of total fear and paranoia and, like, schizophrenia. And so that, like, part of this cabal that operates a lot of the power in the world, like, they want, 
they really want Ukraine because of the resources that it has, the sort of research projects that we're doing, how much Ukraine had essentially been America's bitch since we had done their coup in 2016, which most Americans don't have any clue about. Um, and furthermore, that like, because of the way that we didn't have a larger ongoing war that was hurting the profits of a lot of the war economy uh, companies that we have on the S&P 500 and shit. So, like, I think it was pretty natural and easy for them to make Ukraine into a place of conflict. Um, I think since the end of the Cold War, we have made Russia our bitch so many times continuously that we thought we'd get away with this one again. Despite the fact that, you know, like in the collapse of the Soviet Union, we made very clear promises that NATO would never go past Western Germany, which it pretty much did immediately. Uh, and I think for Putin, he really kind of got to like the his edge, particularly in feeling embarrassed repeatedly about what was going on. So for him, this became something that he wasn't going to compromise on. There's been a lot of overconfidence and esteem in the American industrial complex. And we haven't honored or respected that, you know, like the Turks, for example, now probably are the leaders in actually being able to create drone drone weaponry. Uh, and that's largely from Aragon's personal project that he saw. Uh, and I think as this accelerates, we're going to find more and more people are going to get absorbed by the propaganda that's encouraging World War III and hating Russians and engaging it in uh, ethnic and religious conflicts. Uh, it's pretty clear to me that what's going on in Israel right now is part of a campaign of ethnic cleansing that is from generations of hatred that I think will take more generations, several more generations to get all of that hatred out and actually try to get people to operate together. And I think as this escalates, like there will be a large war in Israel. I do think that that large war will absorb various factions. I won't be surprised if like the Ukrainian war and the Russian war sort of get absorbed into a larger conflict that's in that area. Uh, and I think as it plays out, people are going to start deploying uh, much more radical rogue AI technology that we'll probably lose control of. And that when we actually find that there are rogue killer robots out, like that's kind of when people are going to realize that like Jeez. shit has fucking broken in a very extreme way. And that's when we're going to start to see it like, oh, we're actually like in a conflict with like fundamental evil that's like trying to destroy the world. And they might be very successful with it because like, between Putin and Biden, like they can unilaterally choose to destroy the world. And maybe they'll do that because like, well, one is demented, like because he actually lacks cognitive facility and the other's demented because, well, he seems to not have much of an ethical basis for life and is a sociopath, which is why he got in the position that he's in. So uh, it's pretty dark overall. Um, but with that being said, like, where I think I'll be fine where I live at. Like, I'm prepared in a number of ways to deal with nuclear fallout or anything else that comes from it. Uh, and with that being said, like, I'm finding more and more people actually are like, wow, they're like, this is, like, really dangerous. Um, and most interesting is, like, because I live in California, which is, like, liberal hub of the world, uh, I've found it deeply disturbing at how often I meet people that are purported liberals that are just like, like, Ukraine 100%. And I'm like, I thought you guys were the anti-war party. And they're like, we are, and Putin's starting a war, so we're finishing it. And oh I'm like, my god, because it's brainwashing to the, oh my god, to the square. Jeez. It is, and it's really sad, because like, and I, and I tell them straight up, I'm like, you know, like, I, I used to be a liberal, because to me, like, unequivocally, my most important political perspective is that, like, I'm uninterested in financing or participating in murdering people that I don't know you know like and they're like well what if they're terrorists and I'm like then they're terrorists and like maybe you should go kill them personally but like please don't get me involved like I'm I'm not like well they killed other Americans and I'm like that's really unfortunate for those other Americans like just because the same state claims to have sovereignty over both of us does not give me a real relationship with that person in fact actually I have a much stronger relationship with the Cambodian who had his arms blown off because I feel really bad that my government did that. And I feel a moral obligation to stop any more of those people from losing their limbs. So please don't involve me with it. And please don't act like just because we're both Americans that that means that we should hate people of other nationalities because our government told us to do that. Wow. <laughs> okay. You know, when I zoom back sometimes and reflect together with my wife and um, some other you know, few people that you know, are totally like, you know, totally informed and, and, and open 
sometimes I'm like thinking, you know, we have a daughter. She's like, so you know, she's like, okay, what, what, what's going to happen? Like 2040s, 50s, when the magnetic pole shift, you know, happens. And we know that for a fact, it's going to happen. It's just, you know, we're in the midst of a, of a lot of cycles and people just, you know, dismiss it because they haven't even studied. They haven't even researched it. There's just a lot of information has been suppressed. So maybe we can talk about this some other time because I think you, uh, if you haven't, you know, gone into this, uh, you know, into the rabbit hole, this evidence-based reality, you know, because we, you know, we watch, of course, a lot of, you know, Ben Davidson's, you know, suspicious observers. You might know him on Twitter or X, you know, as a sun weatherman. And he does it like super, like 100% evidence-based everything, you know. So the magnetic field of the Earth, I mean, is, is it has been and always, you know, was the role, uh, the function is to protect us, right? Not all, all kinds of sun, cosmic rays and everything else. And everything is, is culminating, I think, together, right, within the next decade. So, and, you know, it's very, very humbling. Right. I'm just trying to say it's very humbling. And I'm like, OK, you know, is, is our daughter ever be able to, you know, uh, form a you know, create a procreate and have a family of her own? And this is like really hurts, you know, it. it, 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 it oh, yeah. So, you know, because you have children, I'm like, OK, how, how far do you like on a positive note, like <laughs> uh, to wrap this, this could maybe I could to talk to you with, to, with hours. Maybe we can, you know, extend this ne some next time. But um do you see on a positive note, like now besides you know, going back to the roots, you know, doing regional, local stuff, you know, forming communities, you know, all of these, all these things, and then Bitcoin, you know, like how should we go about like on our with our lives then? In all honesty, like I think this all actually culminates into uh, an extremely powerful global movement at some point in time where we actually realize that we are empowered, that most people want peace, that most people want a money that's functional, most people want governments that aren't spending on their military. And like as more and more of us connect on these decentralized social media platforms and have real conversations with each other that seem to have awakened from 2020, I think that we actually become a large enough and powerful enough movement that we can challenge state structures and powers, whether democratically or not. And that as those things collapse, that like part of that dialogue is going to be like, look, like there are very, very, very fucking serious problems going on right now that like we have to address as a global humanity. And it's very clear that the current forms and structures of government aren't going to solve that. So like how... Like, how do we deal with the endemic nature of all of the waste that's been dumped into the ocean? And how do we, like, clean that up in a meaningful way without forcing people into that? You know, like, when the magnetic poles shift, like, there's a number of very extremely alarming problems that come from that that, like, we should actually be prepared for in meaningful and thoughtful ways. And, like, in in that movement that's going to liberate us from nation states and from the tyranny of fiat, I think there's also going to be a bloom of understanding that like it's not just about defeating that system, but it's about creating the new system that's actually going to serve and aid everybody in dealing with the very extreme problems that are coming. You know, like uh, one of the things I find truly terrifying is the way that the idea that if we give the governments enough power that they can change the weather, that it goes, well, look, guys, like environmental destruction is like very real and very, very important. So why the fuck haven't we addressed stuff like deforesting? Because, like, that's, like, a real thing that we could do. Same thing, like, here in the United States. Like, we have massive forest fires that go on continuously that, that cause for huge amounts of carbon to be released in the atmosphere. Why the fuck don't we actually have, like, essentially, like, a fire military unit that organizes communities to, like, go respond to, to these kind of crises? And I think that, like, as all of these dialogues open up and actually become available for people, I feel very similar to the enlightenment of that, like, we're at the time that has come for us to present a real and good argument for why humanity has now stepped past the nation state and why we now need to become network nation states or some, some totally new technological form that can actually address the real problems that we have. And I feel confident that over the next decade, as that dialogue builds, more and more people are going to look at the very serious problems that are going on and go, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. Like I'm going to, I'm going to go with those crazy Bitcoin people. I'm going to start building my community. I'm going to start growing my own food. And I'm really going to start empowering myself for my self sovereignty and the sovereignty of my community. And as that blooms out, I think all these communities will start to connect up and synthesize themselves into what I think will be a truly global international syndicate. 
You know what I'm really ashamed of is um, of in general I mean, of humanity's uh, ignorance and 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 you know non critical thinking and, and 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 not being able or because of you know of the whole system educational system schooling system and the whole brainwashing you know with, with media and everything the whole uh, fucking system has been manipulating indoctrinating so much and brainwashing us so much and 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 I mean they've done really a great job at that and and uh, we're not I and mean, this is why I'm also you know a huge fan of homeschooling because like you know once you start you know sending your your, your your, your your kids i mean besides the social interaction is very important social interaction definitely but like uh i mean i've not, I, I woke i woke up very very late you know i mean i'm a total late bloomer you know i started questioning things very very late and i'm like what the fuck have i ever learned in school you know i had yeah great grades and you know and great whatever <laughs> but um and uh, the thing is that the reality is that we have i mean i'm not uh, you know i had a you know long discussion and uh, on, on, my, on my show with ashton forms and mike harris you might not know them you know but may maybe you've heard of ashton forbes you know who's uh, went into the uh, mysterious disappearance of the mh370 and mm. uh, and that the videos are totally authentic it's that's a fact now but and and it's just so much suppression so much real conspiracies going on that it's like jesus christ i mean what kind of technologies do we already have possess not only within the united states but generally i mean you know different whether it be china russia whatever that uh but especially in the united states and uh, that could just you know just just unleash uh uh you know a wave of evolution with it be energy abundance you know uh a transportation healing uh I mean, a, a total prosperous, uh, thriving civilization we could see, right? But uh, it's just so beyond, you know, people's imagination, let alone comprehension, that it makes me sometimes cry and laugh at the same time. So, uh, you know, but I don't want to, you know, it's it's just too much. It's, it's a chapter for itself, and maybe we could talk about that once you're maybe up to up to speed to that, and maybe you can, you know, watch a couple of interviews with Ashton Forsyth and or others. The technology is there. This is the saddest part. It's already there, right? And um, <laughs> uh, right, sometimes I, I don't know how to, you know, cognitively uh, uh, deal with that because uh, while we are like discussing about, you know, I mean, besides the whole CO2 scam and fraud and scientific fraud that's been going on, but, you know, and, and talk about like whatever so-called fossil fuels, <laughs> which is not fossil, and, you know, and, and energy, like, oh, energy scars and this and that. I mean, it, it's so, it's so, I don't know, it's it's a clown show. So but... it is. And in all honesty, like, I actually think like this is sort of kind of how it's always been. You know, you look at you look at Socrates' apology and like, it's very clear that like he was put on trial literally for like getting kids to question things and mm -hmm. then like in front of everybody he was like so frustrated he was pretty much like look he was like i don't know anything but like these motherfuckers think they know something and they know absolutely nothing and like i am so insulted by how fucking stupid everybody is i'm just gonna kill myself right now in front of everybody <laughs> and like that set the concourse for western philosophy for the last 2500 years and i think that that's still where we're at and so for me a lot of it's about the balance of getting that like most people are going to be morons that get absorbed into contemporary dialogue in life and believe that it's all just superfluous materialism. And that's fine. They'll lead their lives as they want to. For me, I'm really interested in people that are open to questioning things and the creativity that comes out of that. And like to me, I think that's the core cadre that's actually going to transform the globe as we enter into what I believe will be an apocalyptic era. I do think a lot of the insane top secret technologies will go out. It'll start transforming how humanity is evolving. And like very in line with Alexander Dugan's philosophy, I think we're going to have a process of like angelology and demonology where essentially these extremely advanced technologies are going to give us essentially the equivalence of having access to demons that can work for us or angels that can work for us. And that in that gigantic conflict, it'll turn out that like, the angels are actually more powerful that most people are actually good and want to do well in the world and that like when we use these tools and empowerment to actually face down evil as a collective we'll find that like we identify more strongly and spiritually with that collective which will also sort of redeem us from the fucking hatred and awfulness of this world and is going to open the humanity up to a totally new bloom that not only is going to solve a lot of the very endemic problems that humanity is having, but like it's also going to get us into outer space and make us a type one civilization where our children will now have to deal with all of the new issues that come about from having a global humanity that's united under a new political system that's totally foreign to us. 
and it'll be really exciting and dangerous and threatening and frankly for me like a much more fulfilling and big and interesting life than i ever thought it was going to be when i was a kid you know right <laughs> oh man eric you know what i mean with your authenticity and and truth speaking i mean i think you've you've, you've sent a lot you've, uh, you've you've radiated a lot of shock waves to a lot of people i mean maybe most of them might not admit it but i think with your conversations with discussions on conferences i mean i've been following you you know all these all these years i think you've you've really opened up and triggered provoked and and inspired and expanded you know people's consciousness and knowledge so thank you for that really Thank, thank you. I, it feels it's really got, good. It's uh, really authentic articulation of of the truth, right? Of the reality, and I think uh, not not so many people can uh, have the ability to do that. You know, like you, because you have on top of that, you you understand. You know, you have to you comprehend and you you know how to, you know, like put it into words, right? And 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 then on on top of of course, it's your authentic emotions that come with it, the energy emotion, right? <laughs> so thanks. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's taken me a long time to sort of lean in and really start to to gather that more. But I'm feeling more and more comfortable with it, and I'm I'm feeling more and more called to really understanding that. To me, philosophy it's not an academic process, but mm -hmm. it's actually much more of a performative thing of allowing people to entertain and engage these really big and sort of different thoughts of like what what does it truly mean for us to exist here and like what does it mean that we have these powerful technologies that like you and me get to talk right now that like we can exchange money with nobody being a middleman between us like that, that seems to have really profound implications that like i want to invite people to dive in with me and really be curious about like what does that really mean if everyone in the world were to try to do that, or even if some of the people in the world were to do that. And what does it mean for our children and our children's children? And like, let's let's go deep together on this, because I think that if we really allow for ourselves to be in awe and wonder of how truly profound this is and what it can do for humanity, for me, it's been a, a, a rescuing means to my soul to have me go, I am on purpose. I do have a meaning in this world and I am going to continue to strive and choose to put myself out there in a vulnerable way because, you know, haters are going to hate and that's fine. But like, I'm not interested in them. I'm interested in the people that want to listen and engage and together we'll discover that there's something much bigger. And so for me, like getting to have, sit down and have the dialogues with, you know, John Vallis and Princey and, and all of these friends that I've made throughout this community, we both learn so much from each other. And oh, we have yeah. such big dialogues together that have us both coming away feeling really fulfilled. And to me, like, that's the point is that together we're going to learn a lot more through our pursuit on the journey of truth than we are going to be alone. And so, like, I invite anybody who had inklings of curious curiosity here to lean in. Really try to let give yourself permission to learn as much as you can and to fantasize and go crazy with this. Because I think at the depths of it, you'll find people really want to meet you there and you're going to find the most true and authentic version of yourself as well. Yeah. And, you know, I, we, I mentioned, you know, psychedelic experience. I mean, of course, it's one of many or, you know, uh, many uh, uh, keys or methods to to open up you know the perception to whatever to 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 uh, maybe even more you know <laughs> real reality and comprehension and, and and understanding and conscience and and soul you know as you just mentioned so uh and because that, that's a problem i think with humanity or as a human being i think we are so uh unfortunately you know so physically materialistically physically uh attached <laughs> that we we keep forgetting that we have a you know we are soul right it's whatever you know i mean i'm, I'm trying always to connect the, the the dots between science and spirituality you know magnetic field i'm because i'm a huge fan of the advocate of the unified field theory but um and once you get there you know it doesn't have to be this portal opener but it can be as you say you know a conversation like this you know <laughs> that hopefully yeah. and so yeah. so follow it and where where it leads you to because i promise each and every rabbit hole has a path that you can take on it but it's just about your quest and the questioning mm -hmm. of where you want to go and to me like that's that's the truest course of what thinking is is it's not about getting to the answer but it's allowing for you to have that quest into seeking the answers so i congratulate anybody who is interested and is going you know what they sound crazy but I'm going to read more about this stuff. Beautiful said. 
Say, did you now? Uh, what's what's the title of your book or the audio book? That's are you still working on it or? I'm still working on the audio book. My my book here, Crypto Sovereignty, exactly. uh, I released last year. Uh, it's just a series of essays from my website, CryptoSovereignty.org. And it just deals with, it's really a plethora of different essays that deal with much more esoteric topics around sort of the spirituality and uh, the much bigger philosophical conversation that I think Bitcoin implements. Because to me, Bitcoin at its basis is a thought experiment about what it, mean, what it means to be human in modernity where nation states are trying to capture us vis-a-vis -vis technology and how Bitcoin and cryptography empowers us against that. Oh, you're, you're a legend. Uh, Eric, where, where can people find you and where can people buy the book, download the book or eventually maybe? Uh, you can buy the book on uh, Bitcoin Magazine's website or you can get it off Amazon as well. Uh, I'm going to be just nuking my Twitter account in the near future. So if you haven't had an opportunity to get on Noster, I highly recommend it. Please Google it. You'll find many different clients that are available in addition to you'll It'll give you a little bit more cryptographic background and understanding how and why we've built this decentralized censorship resistant platform that really can replace, you know, Twitter and Instagram and all these others, because it turns out that those people are actually exploiting you in very nefarious ways. And you should empower yourself to take back your own power so that you are not selling everything. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got oh, it. And you can still follow me on on Twitter for the time being, but I will be nuking it sometime in the near future. Yeah, no, I can definitely highly recommend. Uh, you know, I mean, it's become so easy. Also, the the, the user friendliness it's got, it's getting easier, easier. I mean, I'm 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 mostly you know Primal.net, and I think it's 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 a great it's just a great tool. You know, yeah, absolutely. All right, my friend. Well, much right, love yeah. to you, and uh, yeah, we'll connect again and have a deeper conversation in the future. Please send yeah. me a couple couple data points that you'd like for me to review or videos to watch, and we'll we'll have a discussion. Okay. I was, was going to mention that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll do that. Eric. All right. Well, much All love right. to you and your family, and thanks for the great conversation today. The well, best wishes, Eric. Talk right. to you soon. Be well, my friend. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>